today we're going to talk about skill shortages in the construction industry as well as recruitment in the industry. I'm joined by Richard Allen here from Skilled Labour Services and Russell Drinkwater from Bond Recruit. Richard, could you just um, tell us a little bit more about your good self? Yeah, so I've been in the industry since I graduated from the University of Portsmouth with my civil engineering degree back in uh, a long, long time ago, back in 1994. Uh, I then worked in industry as a site engineer for Dean and Dybel mainly and a, and a few others. Uh, worked my way up to um, operations manager for a big highways contract in London in about 2005, looking after about, I can't remember what it was now, a big, big old highways maintenance contract anyway, 20 or 30 million turnover per year. Uh, and then in 2007, I thought, well, there's got to be a better way of uh, recruiting and retaining people in the industry because um, from my experience as an operations manager of using agencies, it wasn't a great experience, if I'm honest. Um, and I set up Skilled Labour Services with, with Liam back in 2010, I think. And we've been going ever since, supplying the South with uh, ground workers, trades into the, uh, into the civils mainly civils and building industry. Thank you. Uh, Russell, could you just introduce yourself for us, please? Yeah, of course. So um, I started in the, uh, I started as an apprentice carpenter for Carillion. I'm not, I can't remember the year, if I've got to be completely honest with you, but um, <clears throat> from there, I went on to be a construction manager for Babcocks. From there, I somehow found myself working in recruitment uh, for uh, one of the largest national recruiters. Um, did that for about five years with them and had the opportunity to go off and set up Bond Recruit. Did that now, just coming up to five years ago, supplying um, all from blue collar trades and labour right the way to professional staff across the uh, south coast and Thames Valley. Brilliant. Well, that's, that's great. In fact, thanks for the intro, guys. Yeah. So we're going to start off, um, the video is going to be in two parts. We're going to start off with skill shortages first. Um, I'll just give a quick intro and then we'll we get into the nitty gritty by asking some questions and, and getting some of your thoughts on the matter. So recently, uh, a Construction Skills Network report has revealed that the industry needs approximately a quarter of a million new recruits in the next four years, so by 2026. That's the equivalent of 50 to 60,000 new recruits a year. For me, I've been working in the industry for 20 years. This, this seems like a recurring thing to me, so it doesn't seem anything new. So let, let's start off. If I start off with you, yourself, Richard, why haven't we solved this problem? I guess it never will be solved because it's an industry which has booms and busts. It has companies will go into an area, they'll win a massive contract worth tens, hundreds of millions of pounds, and they won't have a contract in that area again. So the, the, the resource they require is not in one location. As I say, it's very cyclical. Um, and there is still uh, a lot of short termism I see in, in, in terms of people won't stick with one firm for a long time. They won't, uh, and sometimes firms don't invest in bringing people through and training them. And I think it's a mixture of all of that. Uh, and we, as an industry, we have to compete against people that want to sit in front of their computer all day playing uh, whatever, you know, and it, it is tough a day like today when it's peeing down with rain, the wind's battling against the windows and they've got to get in a van at half past six in the morning standing dig holes all day. It's not necessarily that appealing and there is a big, big thing to be solved there. And I guess by talking about it is, is you know, we can look at ways of, of how to do that. Thank you. And, and Russ, what's your thoughts on that? I think um, it's uh, interesting that you said it, Jamie, so you've been in the industry 20 years and it's a recurring issue. Um, that I can see even just from my, my short, short time from starting as a carpenter, I remember them saying there was, you know, so much skill shortage across the whole board. And then what Rich said there about actually it's in particular areas because a contract will win a job and it's not necessarily spread, that shortage isn't spread, you know, evenly across the UK. It will be in certain pockets of areas where the big jobs are. Um, for me, I think a lot of it is is down to training. I think we've sort of de-skilled some of the industry in terms of breaking up packages far more than just sort of like a carpentry package. It goes right the way down just to door hangers now rather than a carpenter doing the kitchens and the doors. Yeah. And so I think a lot of it comes down to apprentices, good long-term apprenticeships with companies. So people that go through these three, five years apprentice actually end up staying in the industry rather than just leaving because it, it, it's almost they don't have the skill to go out and be fully qualified carpenter or site manager because they haven't had the experience. So 
think there's lots of different things, but certainly doing things like this and creating awareness is, is, is a start. And we, we, you mentioned sort of the boom and the bust. Does that lead to um, scenarios or periods of time where we lose a lot of people from the industry? So we talk, you know, obviously we had the Brexit and there's lots of other things that, you know, government policy, industry policy, what have you. Do they kind of also lead to that shortfall? Yeah, I, th I think I think well, government pos policy definitely. Um, with um, a lot of our Eastern European friends have gone back to Eastern Europe with their uh, with their grant money. Thank you very much. Hashtag sort of thanks, Rishi. <laughs> <laughs> I've taken my fifty thousand pound grant and I've gone home and built myself a palace in Romania. And that, that's that's a fact. I, I don't know whether <laughs> others believe it, but yeah, we we've certainly lost a, a good proportion of our, our workforce in the last few years. Um, whether they'll come back again, who knows? Uh, I think immigration is always important when you look back historically at where the workforce has come from. Going back when I started, there was a lot of Irish around. You don't see many of those anymore. Then the Eastern Europeans have come. Uh, and I think we probably do need another wave of immigration um, because I don't think there's enough British born, if you like, people coming through that want to work in the industry necessarily. And immigration is an important part of where, where the skills you know, future people are going to come from. And why do you think, um, what's your thoughts on why we don't have British or English people coming into the industry and wanting to do these jobs? I think it's a demographic thing, isn't it? And that there's a shortage of people being born in this country that, you know, there's a lot of jobs, there's a lot of opportunity, there's massive vacancies right across the piece. And, you know, I, I just don't think there's enough people being born here to want to do it. I just... It's just as simple as that. It's a demographic thing, I think. And, and is that to suggest that the opportunities elsewhere, maybe not in construction, are better than construction or more appealing or more attractive? Is that I think, what as I suggesting? said earlier, I, th I think it's a bit of both. I think if, if you're a practical person and don't like being in the office environment, it's great to be out on site and, and whatever else. But, yeah, the, obviously it's a big competitive world in many, many industries, lots of which are paying very, very well. And, yeah, it is a competitive thing although I would say that I think construction trades are paid pretty well now and, and Russ on the sort of professional um, mm. recruitment side of things <clears throat> what what do you see has led to some of the skill shortages or some of the factors that lead to skill shortages I think um, on on the professional side so what we've seen most recently in terms of, sort of legislation that, that has hindered it or, or has made it probably worse is like some of the um, some of the government stands like on IR thirty five, mm. that caused a real problem sort of a year ago or eighteen months or how long ago that was. Now that started, you know, I think we've had managers and engineers that have been trading into limited companies for twenty odd years or thirty odd years that have been working and supporting the local you know businesses that that, that require their services. They get to a sort of a, an age where, you know, if I if they can't operate through their limited company that they've always worked. They much rather just pack it in rather than go PAYE. You know, they provide a good service, and that has that we've seen has been a real a real factor because there isn't the people coming through that are going to PAYE or want to be paid CIS. So we've suddenly lost a proportion of very very skilled, very knowledgeable people just from one government reform, which I thought was really difficult. Um, but um, I think certainly, you know, I, I always lean back on terms of the training. We, 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 have to, we have to try and find a way to find it more appealing for young people to be picking up either, you know, a, a trowel or, or what it may be to get them into construction. I think somehow there needs to be some peace done there in colleges. So, so, so on that, I mean, you, you, you picked up a few things there that, you know, we can see as the, the challenges. But if we, we go back to the, the intro there of fifty to 60,000 people per, per annum, what, what are the other, you know, to add to what you've just said, the other challenges we face? And is it even doable? Is, it, is that what the issue is? We keep talking about it because it mm. isn't actually doable and never actually gets done. Yeah, I think um, it's weird, isn't it, saying, is, is it doable? It's it, If we look at, because I can only comment on the region I suppose I work in, because then they're, they're the contractors that I know that are short in staff. I think, is it doable? Probably yes. But I think the, the way that you're going to have to get these additional professionals in is clients are going to have to be more attractive in the way that they recruit people. 
you know, they need to be investors in people. They need to show that they're going to develop and take people's career to the next level to gain that attraction. And are we so so for, so we, we we're putting the emphasis on the client, the employer, and and I think that's right. It has to be an attractive proposition. But where are these people then coming from? And does that mean because we're making it more attractive, we're bringing transferable skills? Maybe graduates that have worked in uh, a different degree can then move across, or reskilling people from a different background. Is is that kind of what you're thinking, or do these people? Where are these people coming from? Well, I, th I, th I think they're coming from. Um, I think they're coming from the the, the the I suppose the youth that is going through college and university. I think from a professional level, I still find I think from a professional level that there's quite a, an attraction for project managers, quantity surveyors from that side, and from the trades and labour division. I think that, that there needs to be more push from colleges about how attractive that industry can actually be, and then you're not just stumbled or stuck in a position of being on the tools, there is that growth opportunity. So I think colleges and schools have got, you know, a bit that they need to push on. And then certainly from uh, the client side, they need to be more attractive as well. So it's feeding from both because it's only the youth that's going to change the scenario where we've got, we need 50,000 yeah. a year. I don't think it's going to really be too much cross, you know, a crossover from someone else's industry into construction. I, w I wouldn't have thought. Right. And, and, and what about on the, the labour side? So Russ is saying it's doable. Yep. Do you agree it's doable? And where, where are the, 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 the trade, these additional trades people coming from? I think uh, education is a great point, as, as Russ was just saying. Uh, my daughter was just going into the college system now, and there is a wealth of courses that you can do in construction and across the piece, um, practical things, rather than in my day, it was just do your A-levels or get a job now there's so much vocational stuff you can do and I think construction colleges need to really promote themselves and, and get people interested and engaged and get people that way and just out of interest what are the what sort of uh, trades at the moment are in demand what you, you, you probably see that in cycles so it's not just holistically it's, labor yeah. it's, it's certain trades so what are we seeing at the moment uh, well, our specialism is, is ground workers, and there is a shortage of good ground workers, machine operators, plant operators. Yeah, yeah it's just a it's an ongoing shortage, which has been for years. And what about on the professional side? I think you you touched on project management, didn't you, and quantity mm. surveyors? I mean, where where's the shortfall at, at the moment? And on that shortfall, you know, what can what can we do about those type of uh, disciplines? I think uh, again, it's you know, it's it. it it's calling on the youth system that's coming through and the colleges and actually just thinking that Rich made a point there about, um, I think you said your daughter or your son, sorry, was going mm. through college. Mine's the same, my, my 16 year old daughter's about, you know, to apply to colleges. We did an open day the other day and they now get, you know, essentially three years free education. So if we have these colleges and these schools or sixth forms or whatever it may be, providing really good knowledge on actually the construction industry in, you know, the professional terms, I think you'll see a, a, a huge influx of people that will go through it because it's a, you get three years free education, mm. which is a no-brainer, which can lead on to university. So you can go on to do, do a degree. Um, and, it's, and it's an industry that's never going away. It's always, you know, build is a way of life. That's always going to happen. So I just, I think that the colleges, universities and schools need to be just making it more appetising for these young youngsters who don't know what they want to do with their life yet and giving them more option in that professional service. So you've, again, some more interesting points. You, you've touched on clients need to make roles more attractive. You've talked about, obviously, training the education side of things, whether that's your, your CITBs or whether that's, mm -hmm. you know, um, MVQs or degrees or, post, you know, post-degree qualifications. But they're not going to do that in, in isolation. So, so what does the recruitment agencies, recruitment consultant, the employment world do in terms of getting these people around the table? How, how can we how can we bring all of those those three things together and make it happen? Yeah, I mean, we do. Um, we, we've been looking at and talking to to colleges about doing open days. So we can give the advice on from our point of view as well in terms of talking to these youngsters that are coming through. Um, what unfortunately we can't do as recruiters is bring people in that aren't skilled into uh, companies that are requiring skilled or, or trainee people. Yeah. But what we can do is educate them on a route out. So we get fluctuations of, of, um, 
of vacancies in professional services. But if those people aren't there, they aren't there, we can't manage magic them up. But what we can do is talk to them about a, a training program where we can sponsor people to go into education and work their way up at placements in these construction companies. So that can be a link in between as well. Okay, and, and so, so Russ just mentioned a, a, a sort of college stage. Yeah. Is, is when we're talking about creating industries more attractive, is that a bit late? Should we be should we be somehow promoting the industry at a much earlier stage? And and what and what stage would that be? Primary school, secondary school. Primary school was no reason reason why not at all. I, I was in um, Berrywood School a few, well a few years ago now, but talking to the kids about construction when my daughter was there and yeah we went into the class and we gave them a load of paper each and they had to build a bridge out of paper and sellotape and it was just a bit of a very gentle introduction to how bridges work and and everything else and they loved it you know and, and to get them thinking about construction from a very early age is yeah it's great because if, if you are a not particularly academic or you, you're not particularly suited to that office environment it's a fantastic career Fantastic, and uh, and do you do you think also because uh, obviously you mentioned college mm. that that you know an earlier an earlier stage would be more beneficial? Yeah, definitely. I think I did, even if it's just an awareness of what what the industry can provide is in terms of a, a future mm. career. Definitely. I mean, you know, I don't know how that works in terms of a curriculum, but the um, you know in in terms of awareness, I think that is needed much much earlier on. Okay, thanks for that. So, so we, we've we've talked about the, the sort of process of making it, you know, making the industry more attractive. How we bring more people into the industry. Let's just talk about how we how we connect candidates, if you like, to employers. So, is there a list misalignment of expectations from candidates and employers? Oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I said they've been some yeah. tricky yeah. ones. <laughs> if, if we if we're talking about um, if we're talking about work from a recruiting angle, if we're talking about working with a say regional national business that we deal with on a day to day, we should know everything that they're after. You know, if if a recruiter doesn't, there is going to be a misalignment because if I if I didn't know exactly what you were after, hypothetical, how am I supposed to go find that person? And then it's the same as you're as you're working with the candidate. Mm -hmm. Unless you know exactly the real motivations, but what they're after, you are never going to get the match together. So, to go to your question, there is a misalignment. One hundred percent, that happens all the time. Um, but it is down to the individual, the middle individual, the recruiter, to work out what each party are actually after and pair that together the best you can. And Rich, from your side of things, where, what, what, where do you see, let's start with the employer. Where's the misalignment of the employer's expectation of the, the candidate, the employee? Okay, so I guess sometimes employers think that we've got, I've got 25 grand workers in my back pocket that I can uh, receive a phone call at three o'clock on a Friday and magically we'll have a team of 10 uh, digging foundations on Monday morning, um, which isn't necessarily that, that realistic or practical. And then um, on the other way, it, it's, it's the other side when they just don't give us any notice when things are finishing. And we work absolutely our best when we've got three or four or 10 or, or whatever it is, companies that are all need labor. And we just kind of matching one against the other. So when one's demand is dropping and another one's picking up, we can move our resources, done a great job for that company onto that company. And it works really well when it works properly because we keep we can keep really good teams of men going for months and years and the clients win because they get reliable labor day one who are straight at it, straight at it producing the goods and you know if that's that's the sweet spot but it doesn't always work that way okay thank you so so I'm coming to you now we've, yeah. we've talked about lots of lots of really good stuff here around skill shortages, some of the issues, shortfalls, where people may or may not come from, the process of education and employers. So I'm coming to you now as the expert. What, what, how do we fix this in the short term and how do we fix this in the long term? Uh, I don't know. Will it ever be fixed in the long term? As you were saying earlier, it's been going for 20 years. There's always going to be a mismatch because if we suddenly encourage 10 million kids to go into construction, there's going to be no jobs for nine and a half million people or, or, or whatever. And then the other way around. So I, I don't, I think it's an ongoing work of art. I guess it's like painting a fourth bridge. It will never be finished, but you've just got to keep going and keep going with the best intentions. And, and everybody does their bit. 
you know, we colleges do their bit, we do our bit is trying to bring, you know, people that have got no skills and skill them up. Same with Russ, same with yourselves, and it's just everybody working together towards the end goal, I think, and it should hopefully keep sort itself out. And and same question to you, Russ. It's not a too dissimilar answer to Rich, <laughs> I've got to be honest. It's you know, is this ever an issue that's gonna go away? Probably not. I think it's um, it's everybody taking accountability for their section. You know, as a, a construction owner, them you know being attractive and putting the right training programs in place. Us as recruiters doing what we can to um, support colleges, getting people through, and bringing them into the companies like yourself, and then also education doing their part and raising awareness that construction can be a fantastic career. Okay, thank you. Really great stuff there, guys. Thank you very much. What I want to do, though, is just to wrap up. Obviously, I've been asking the questions, but you're the expert in the field. Yeah. What haven't I asked, and what do you want to share with anybody that we haven't discussed in the field? Rich? Um, I, think, I think you've covered it very well, actually. Um, it's just, just to say, a yeah, tough question. Uh, no, I think, I think you're, you're there. I think we've covered most of it. I think it's... It's just to summarise, as I said before, it's just a question of just everybody doing their bit and understanding the other person's position. So so clients understanding what recruiters are trying to do for them and the other way around, really, and, and just everyone working together because of, you know, problem shared is a problem halved and everything else, and it's, it's just working through it. OK, thanks. And Russ, anything you'd like to share or anything I haven't covered that, that you know, on the subject? I don't think so. I just the the only thing I'd be is it'd be you know if someone was thinking about getting into construction, talk to you know talk to as many people as you can about all the different sectors that you could get involved with. It doesn't mean you just have to be standing outside wet on a building site covered in mud. There's loads of different avenues, um, and um, you know s seek advice from from professional services. Really, yeah. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much for your time, Russ. Thank you very much, Richard. No problem. Appreciate it. So I hope you found value in this video. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact us. And we really look forward to hearing from you.